one of Hollywood's most famous families and most legendary acting dynasties. Henry, Jane, and Peter Fonda. Each leading an extraordinary life, enjoying successful careers in film, television, and theater. Patriarch Henry first made his mark on Broadway in the mid-1920s and went on to star in 106 movies, television shows, and shorts. Some of his most notable films include The Grapes of Wrath, The Oxbow Incident, Mr. Roberts, and Twelve Angry Men. Well, maybe it's like Casey says. The fella ain't got a soul of his own, just a little piece of a big soul. The one big soul that belongs to everybody. Then... Then what, Doc? Then it don't matter. I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and they know supper's ready. And when the people are eating the stuff they raise and living in the houses they build, I'll be there too. I don't understand it, Tom. Me neither, Ma, but just something I've been thinking about. Now, are you trying to tell me that this knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket, someone picked it up off the street, went to the boy's house, and stabbed his father with it just to test its sharpness? No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. It's just possible. Take a look at this knife. It's a very unusual knife. I've never seen one like it. Neither had the storekeeper who sold it to the boy. Aren't you asking us to accept a pretty incredible coincidence? I'm just saying a coincidence is possible. And I say it's not possible. Where did that come from? It's the same night. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Over five decades, Henry earned more than a dozen award nominations and won the Academy Award for Best Actor for his very last film on Golden Pond, which also starred his daughter Jane. Getting dark, Chelsea. What are you calling Chelsea? I'm Billy, remember? Hey, come on, man. Hey, are you okay? Of course I'm okay. Okay. Hey, we better hurry up and catch Walter, huh? I mean, I'm not gonna be here much longer. Yeah, neither am I. Miss you, Norman. What? Jane, who made her Broadway debut in 1960, was soon earning Tony nominations and starring roles on the big screen as well, including more than 40 well-known films. Morals, principles, this rubbish, nonsense. I speak only of truth and of essence. What have you done with the positronic ray? I said, that's it. What does it do? All persons and objects in this path are deminimized to the fourth level. You mean? That's right. They're placed in the fourth dimension irretrievably. But that's monstrous. <laughs>
What is that? What? Where's your bridesmaid's dress? Oh, I gave it to Ruby's daughter. She works at Hooters. She was thrilled. I don't have a daughter. Oh. <laughs> take off that white dress right now, or I'll take it off for you. Don't you tell me what to do. You did not just poke me. Don't you touch me, you two-bed tramp. Oh. Oh, my God. Viola, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean you. You don't go and slap somebody and then apologize. Get some backbone. God, this is crazy. Why don't you just face it? I am marrying Kevin today and there's nothing you can do about it. You face it. You'll never be good enough for him. Judy, you've got to help me. That mob has gone crazy out there. They're trying to kill me. Well, why would they want to do a nasty thing like that? I don't know. I'm not such a bad guy. You're a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. As her career evolved, Jane's life and passions changed. Soon, she was also known as a political activist and later an exercise guru, in addition to her status as a major Hollywood celebrity. Peter Fonda, Jane's younger brother, also got his start on Broadway and, like his father and sister, made his way onto the big screen. His array of films include Lilith, The Young Lovers, The Wild Angels, and The Trip. But his most well-known work was Easy Rider, which he produced, wrote, and starred in. The Fondas are true Hollywood royalty, a family who has spent their entire lives in the spotlight. Enjoy this special look at their sometimes tragic but rich lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lunch and Learn co-chairs Stephen Karras and Lee Wolf and special guest, New York Times best-selling author Scott Iman. You know, I have to tell you, sitting on these chairs, we got new chairs, and I sat down and I felt like Dr. Ruth. Remember, she can't put her feet on the ground. So they gave, <laughs> they gave us a pillow. Well, let me say how honored we are to have Scott Iman with us today. I, I don't know if you remember, but about 20, maybe three years ago, <laughs> yes, I was five at the time. We, we worked together, and it was when Lunch and Learn was called the Cultural Society, and it was a whole new thing. But since then, Scott has uh, written 15 books, three of them New, new York Times uh, bestsellers, including his definitive biographies of both uh, John Wayne and Cecil B. DeMille, and for more than 25 years, he was the book critic for the Palm Beach Post. And now he has written a book that's entitled Hank and Jim, The 50-Year Friendship of Henry Fonda and James Stewart. And let me tell you, I read this book, and as soon as I read it, I said, this man has got to join us. And any of you who love the stories of old Hollywood, the book will be sold outside after uh, our performance, and it, you can get an autographed copy. So, buy one. Anyway, I just, uh, you know, it's very interesting that we see celebrities, we see them perform roles. We saw in the film both uh, the Oxbow incident, uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath, and we somehow conflate the persona on the screen with the real person. Now, you've done a lot of research about Henry Fonda. Was there a confluence between the screen Henry Fonda, the roles he played, and the real Henry Fonda? Yeah, definitely. There was a moral center to his performances, the performances we think of when we think of Henry Fonda, Tom Joad, and Juror Number 8, and uh, 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 Lady Eve, even uh, all the great Fonda performances, he's a, he, he's, he has a certain set of expectations that he won't back do, back off of. 
Uh, and that was very much who he was as a man. And that's why he much preferred stage to uh, movies, as a matter of fact, because it's very hard to do the kind of work in movies that he really wanted to do. It's easier, he felt it was, he had more access to the to grid scripts and access to an audience on stage than as in a movie, where there's so many people in between you and what you're trying to achieve, the editor, the studio, the musicians, the director, the, 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 the there's just an army of people between you and the audience, whereas on stage, it's a direct connection. Right. But do you think as a Nebraska boy, maybe, he did not uh, enjoy being in that Hollywood scene? He didn't like movies much. Uh -huh. he, he, he made over 100 movies. He probably didn't even look at 80 of them. Masochist. He didn't like movies and went no. over him. Hmm. No, he considered himself a stage actor who, who, who had this uh, somewhat shameful sideline. The list of movies of his own that he really liked, that he would watch, you could count on two hands. Hmm. Uh, the John Ford movies, My Darling Clementine, Young Mr. Lincoln, uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath, of course. Uh, 12 Angry Men. He loved the Hitchcock film. He did The Wrong Man. Uh, he loved Once Upon a Time in the West, where he played his only psychopathic heavy. Uh, he had a great experience doing that and loved the film. Uh, but it's a small group of films that he really liked of his own work. Well, do you tell us a little bit about his, the beginnings? He was in Nebraska. He was mentored by Marlon Brando's mother, as a matter of fact. That was his mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in a like little theater, a regional yes, theater. Yes, Doe Brando. His, her name was Dorothy Brando. He always referred to her as Doe. Uh, Doe Brando, uh, uh, he was just a kid uh, working at an insurance adjuster's office. He had two years of journalism school uh, and then dropped out. And he really had no particular direction in his life. And he said he owed his entire life to Doe Brando because it never, ever would have occurred to him to be an actor. It just would, would have been like saying, why don't you be a chemical engineer? And he's a kid in Nebraska. It just was he didn't even, it wasn't in his, in his horizon. And his parents weren't thrilled about no. it either. I no. mean, I, I have to interject here because, and I read this in your book, so this is one of the wonderful vignettes. He was in a play and his parents were very much against his being an actor. As a matter of fact, his father would not speak to him for six weeks after he found out he was going to be in this play. and. But the parents attended the play. They came home, and his sister and his mother were a little critical. Well, you know, he should have done this. He should. And the father's reading a newspaper, and he puts it down, and he looks up, and he says, shut up. He was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Yeah. But he always felt he owed Dobrando his entire life. And years later, when he was doing Mr. Roberts on Broadway, and he won the Tony Award, and the play won a Pulitzer Prize, and everything else, and it was the part of his lifetime. Uh, he got uh, Doe's daughter, Marlon's sister, Jocelyn Brando, the female lead in uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, Nurse Anne Gerard, for those of you who've seen the play or the movie, uh, which was her ticket to a career, you know, because he felt he just owed Doe Brando everything, so he was always, he always felt indebted to the Brando family. So when he, he went to New York, he made the plunge, mm -hmm. and he met Jimmy Stewart mm -hmm. and Josh Logan, and they were a group living together under... Uh, rather poor circumstances. Um, tell us a little bit about that and his meeting with Margaret Sullivan. Well, he, had f he, he went to New York and uh, he latched on to a group called the University Players, which had been formed by Josh Logan, uh, who was a young undergraduate at Princeton. And he thought if he got a bunch of actors and uh, actresses and would-be directors together, they could form a kind of uh, ambitious Stanislavski-style theater in America. This is in 1929, 1930. Uh, and Fonda became the romantic lead, even though he had only a couple credits at, in the Omaha Playhouse. But he was gorgeous, he could act instinctively, and then he met Margaret Sullivan, who was the ingenue in the company. And they fell madly, passionately, crazily in love, and they were the romantic leads on Cape Cod for several years. Uh, they eventually married. The marriage blew up uh, within about four months. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, it was a hit and run, <laughs> hit and run marriage, yeah. Uh, More hits than runs, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he was devastated, and he, he took it very hard because he was truly uh, deeply in love with her. Uh, and she easily moved on to Broadway and Jed Harris, and then she was off to Hollywood, and meanwhile, Fonda is languishing in New York 
Whereupon Logan, Josh Logan again, said, look, it's 1932. They didn't know it was the worst year of the Depression, but it was. So Logan suggested they all get an apartment together, and whoever was working would get the bed, and whoever wasn't working would get the couch. <laughs> So that's the way they worked it out. And it was a kind of this, this impoverished frat house atmosphere. Logan was there, Stewart was there, Fonda was there, uh, Burgess Meredith would drop in from time to time when he was, all these young actors looking for purchase in the Depression. Uh, the, 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 the apartment house where they were living was on the site of where Lincoln Center is now. Uh, then they, after two years, they, they moved in together in the late fall of 32. Uh, they moved down to the village in 34. And then Fonda got lucky, finally, and got a play that was a hit, and was the lead. And Hollywood came calling, and they hired him to come out to L.A. Fonda. and make a movie version but of the play. But didn't Stewart go out first and no. then, no? Fonda went first, Stewart followed six months later, and Stewart moved right in with Fonda again. Uh, and they Fonda. flew kites? Uh, that would, no, that was after the war. <laughs> uh, before the war, they went out with girls. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> after the war, they were, they were happily married men, so they had to find other hobbies. And their wives told them to go fly a kite. Uh -huh. Is that it? Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Gotcha. So um, he is, is out in Hollywood. He's had this relationship with uh, Margaret Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And do you think he ever got over that? No, I don't. They were always in each other's lives on some level. Uh, Sullivan's second husband was William Wyler, the legendary director. Her third husband was Leland Hayward, who was the agent for both Fonda and Stewart. So it was a kind of incestuous, weirdly familial thing uh, when Fonda left Hollywood to go in 1947 to go to New York and reinvent himself as a stage actor. He moved about three blocks away from Sullivan and Leland Hayward. Yeah. And uh, uh, Fonda's daughter Jane and uh, Margaret Sullivan's daughter, uh, 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 Brooke, uh, Brooke Hayward, Brooke Hayward, went to the same school yeah. and were best friends. So they saw each other incessantly. They, they were part of the warp and woof of each other's life. Uh, although they each understood, and the kids, it's interesting, because Peter told me they always thought uh, that Hang Henry and, and Margaret were still sleeping together. But there's absolutely no evidence of it. I mean, I've gone through Margaret Sullivan's correspondence, and there's no trace of it, any kind of romantic. Well, I don't going think on. I'm not sure she would write about. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> but the kids were convinced that they were going to get remarried at some point. But uh, they, each of them, I think, realized that it was just too explosive, or because they were both alphas. Fonda was an alpha male, and Sullivan was an alpha female, and neither one believed the word compromise existed, so it wouldn't work. And it's interesting, his subsequent four wives that, you know, that succeeded Margaret Sullivan were not alpha female. No. They were all quite compliant, mm -hmm. and, except, well, well, maybe Alfera, more the, the Italian one. More compliant than Margaret Sullivan is, is not hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there's another interesting thing I wanted to ask you because Henry, who had a very liberal facade, certainly he was, and I think Jane was inculcated with that sense of, of social justice as well, yet while she put her money where her mouth is, so to speak, and was an activist, he really was not. I mean, when his friends, you know, the, the Bogarts, Lauren Bacall and Danny Kaye and... Uh, John Garfield went to Washington to protest the House on American activities. He did not go. And when he was told that Jane, when she was, uh, you know, in Vietnam, that she was a communist, and he said, if I ever thought that she was a communist, I'd turn her in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think she got over that. No, that's, the, well, it was a, that's a generational thing. Uh, although he was, a, he was an extreme Roosevelt New Deal liberal. He fought in World War II in the Navy. He was in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And Stewart, of course, was a B-24 bomber pilot in, in Europe. So the idea that someone would have any kind of divided loyalty, when this is when Jane, of course, was doing her Hanoi Jane period and being photographed with the North Vietnamese gun emplacements, was appalling to him. And he was willing, although he, this is nothing he ever said publicly. This was strictly between him and Jane that he told her this, that if he ever thought she was a communist, he would turn her in. Uh, pro publicly, he always backed her up. He never mm -hmm. cut the ground yeah. out from under her feet. 
Well, I think, though, as I recall, well, anyway, I, as I recall, he did say this in an interview, and she found out about it and was utterly decimated. Uh -huh. I mean, th their relationship was, was quite shaky. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask Scott something. Yeah. Back up just a sec. 15 books, three New York Times bestseller. This very well could be the fourth. Um, what was the hardest of the 15, just the hardest book to do the research for? John Ford. My and book on John Ford. Okay. It took six years. Took six years. Six years. This yeah. book took what? Two? Three. Three, three and a half. Three and a half. So that's not unusual. No, 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 no. It was. It was. A, it was a long, it's a very difficult life because there was such a uh, disparity between the nobility of the work and the squalor of the life. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep reminding. I had to keep because it was like being. I, I tell people it was like being locked in a phone booth with a drunk for six years. <laughs> Oh. Well, he was a drunk. He was. And, or, or like being stuck in a Eugene O'Neill play for six years. You don't want to be there. <laughs> long day's journey. Yeah, yeah, long day's journey. And it was just a very, uh, uh, it was a completely fulfilled life as an artist, mm -hmm. but it was completely unfulfilled as a human being, as a man. And that was, uh, I had to juggle that disparity. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, did he discuss with Jimmy Stewart family issues. I mean, they were best friends forever. Mm -hmm. did, did he confide in him about his, let's say, his concerns with Jane? The odd thing about that friendship is they knew each other so well they didn't have to talk much. Oh. Uh, Peter told, Peter Fonda told me that after the war, Fonda and Stewart would get together to build these radio-controlled model airplanes with like six-foot wingspans. And they would sit there for three hours. And Peter liked to watch them. And they would sit there for three or four hours, and the only conversation was, Jim, you got the glue over there? <laughs> and Stuart would hand the glue over, and then Stuart would say, you, 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 got, you, got, you got part C27 over there, and Fonda would hand him part C27. And, but that was it. It was strictly functional conversation. Right, so it was and a Peter rest said, from their lives. But Peter, sa Peter said it was such a, they took such deep pleasure, it was so serene, mm -hmm. because neither one of them was particularly serene Right. left to their own devices. Yeah. But when the two of them Intense. were together, the temperature lowered, right. and they were calm, and, yeah. and the ocean was smooth, and the right. sailing was easy. Right. And, it's and Peter loved to be around for that. Because Henry was very liberal, and, and Jane, Jimmy was right wing. I mean, yeah. And they never, ever discussed politics. Once. Yeah, once. And, once and ended it. That, well, it was an ugly conversation. It was 1947, yeah. and, they said, never and the House on American Activities Committee was rolling. And uh, Stewart thought it was a necessary thing, and Fonda was appalled and thought it was un-American, un unconstitutional. And for the first time in their relationship, they got into an argument, I mean a real argument, and it got heated, and voices were raised. And at some point, they both stopped, because they were stomping around in very thin emotional ice. Yeah. And they both understood, again on the instinctual level, that the relationship between them meant more to them than their political identities. So they made an agreement to never again discuss politics. And they never did. And, and, and they'd have and had a lifelong friendship. Oh, yeah, what, until Fonda's death. 50 years. 50 years, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Peter, Peter said, well, Jane, Jane said about her brother Peter, mm -hmm. um, he had it easy. Mm -hmm. If he was scared, he'd cry. Mm -hmm. If he was sick, he'd complain about it. Jane was busy holding her breath her whole life mm -hmm. to be perfect in the eyes of her father. Mm -hmm. um, but he took his mother's death the hardest. Mm -hmm. He was only eight. He gathered Christmas gifts, put them on a chair. And you would think a father or a sister would think that was a beautiful thing. Well, I read that Henry was irate about that, mm -hmm. and Jane sided with dad. Is Excuse that, me, is that Steve. True? We should tell the audience we have good, that their mother committed suicide, yeah, we and didn't they do were that. not told that. And so he. Right. Yeah. They found no, they, out. Fonda he, and. Uh, uh, his mother-in-law told the kids that their mother had had a heart attack and right, died. Right, right. Bang. Only later and did And then they Brooke find Hayward, who <laughs> was, the, was the one who told Jane that her mother committed suicide. She found it out this way. No, they were, she was reading a movie magazine. She was yeah. with Jane, and Jane was reading a movie magazine. This is six months later. Yeah. And they come across a picture of Henry Fonda. It said, sadly, Henry's wife, of, of Frances, died by her own hand six months ago. And Brooke knew. All the kids in school yeah. knew. Right. But they had all the, the headmistress of the school said, nobody say anything to Jane. It was this conspiracy of silence. Mm -hmm. 
and she looked at Jane, and Jane read the paragraph and flipped the page. Yeah. There was no visible response. Right. right. And as, as Steve is saying, it was Peter who really vented. Yeah. Right. And well, he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. It wasn't, it wasn't happening with his father, and mm -hmm. certainly not with Jane. Um, although Peter did not achieve the, the success that his father or his sister did, mm -hmm. he had the best relationship with Henry from the looks of it. Mm -hmm. By um, far. Hmm? By, by far. By far. Well, yeah. it's interesting because Jane told me that her father was actually harder on Peter because Peter was a boy and she was uh -huh. a girl and men of that generation gave girls a much longer leash, mm -hmm. whereas they expected the boy to become a carbon copy of themselves. Right. Uh, and she said Peter was poetic and he, he wasn't a jock and he wasn't, he, did, he, he didn't, he did, he was very sensitive and he didn't have that burn inside him that Fonda did, right. that Henry did. Right. So he, she said, actually, he was much harder on Peter than he was on me. But today, it's 180 degrees. Jane, when Jane talks about her father, this is what she does. Hmm. She oh. folds her, her legs over and puts her arms across her. Right. And the body language is so, protecting her is heart. so protective. Mm -hmm. Whereas if Peter's talking about his father, right. He's like this, and Peter just just tells just luscious, loving, funny. Right. Well, uh, that's who uh, Peter uh, always was, stories. and that's who Jane remains. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, we had the picture when you mentioned that the picture that was here. It was so indicative of their mm -hmm. relationship because you see Henry very close to Peter. He's leaning toward Peter. Mm -hmm. Jane is off. Arms uh, folded. Uh, not holding. They're not. Right. You know, often in family pictures, you hold each other around. She's off on the side. Henry is looking at Peter, and Peter Jane is looking out this way. He probably was. He looks stoned. Yeah. Happily he stoned. He always was. <laughs> but, well, uh, but, if but, you're going to be stoned, be happily stoned. Well, Peter, speaking of Peter and stoned, Easy Rider, 1969, enormous sure. counterculture success, inspiring mm -hmm. others to go in that direction film-wise, mm -hmm. co-produced. I think it cost maybe $400,000 mm -hmm. max to make. And his father, publicly, and I think otherwise, enormously proud mm -hmm. of his son and, and uh, verbal about it. And Jane, he said, she's the greatest actress I have ever seen. Right. But boy, did he shut down at night. Yeah, he would go, <laughs> Fonda, yeah. Fonda would go into radio silence. He just, he didn't have any small talk and he could go easily a day or two without speaking. Right. And he wasn't particularly angry. That was just the way he was. But it's, it, the, the, the tension could build up and build up. As you know? a young girl, Jane said in the book, her book, um, it was as if he was biding time at home in Connecticut when mm -hmm. they lived there so he could get to Broadway and be who he was. But he, and I, She's I don't know if anybody right. can relate well, to having was. a father like that. It, mm -hmm. My father was like that. Um, Lots and, of people's so, fathers and I think and it's mothers. not uncommon. No, you know, not but here we, we know everything about them because they're so public. But you know, Steve, what, and, and th this is very was so interesting to me that the day that his wife, well, his estranged wife, uh, that was Frances Brokow, who was his second wife. And incidentally, as an aside, Brokow's first wife was Claire Bruce Luce with whom he had an affair, and he was a drunk, and he was a, an abusive husband. And Francis then married Henry, the second wife, and the, and the two children were Jane and, and Peter. And I was in the midst of a story, and I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, Broke off. No, no, what I was, it was, go on. To, uh, OK, OK. <laughs> you said that Jane never really seemed to realize well, How no, much Jane, her father he, did adore her. No, but because he had no, because he, he couldn't express that. He could tell he could tell other people that he thought she was a great actress, mm -hmm. but it was hard for him to tell her. He, the first time he saw Jane act was in a Omaha Playhouse. They he would always go back to Omaha to do benefits for the Playhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there, and there, the Henry Fonda the, the Henry Fonda stage is still there. Uh, but he would always go back uh, to do a benefit for the Omaha Playhouse in memory of Doe Brando, mm -hmm. who, by the way, became a hopeless alcoholic and drank herself to death. Uh, mm. But he, they did a benefit performance of The Country Girl, the Clifford Odette's play, mm -hmm. and he'd never seen Jane act. And she's about 18 at this point, 18 or 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And he stood in the wings watching her do a scene, and he said, I realized that she, if she wanted to be an actress, she could be a great actress. 
because it was all there. Right? Well, it was the, really uh, when she went to the actor studio. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Lee Strasberg, when she did, told her, you're going to be a great actress. And I remember what I was going to say, and it was very dramatic. <laughs> but I'm not doing any more asides. I'm just going <laughs> to right along. And that is that the day that, that Francis uh, Brokaw uh, Fonda committed mm -hmm. suicide, Henry went to play in Mr. Roberts that night and yeah. gave one of the great performances of, of, of his life in Mr. Roberts that just, and, and heard that his wife had committed suicide and went off to do the play. Lee, she, she was in a facility at that point and came home, right? right. Well, and she went, came. ran upstairs to... No, she was in the facility where she killed herself. She killed right. herself so she in the facility. She came home for That's a right. moment mm -hmm. and, vis and, and uh, Peter... Uh, somebody said, J Mommy's home, do you want to see her? And Peter, of course, said yes, and Jane did not. And she right. took that, well, that um, knife or something that was in the medicine Razor cabinet. Blade. She came right. and she went back to the facility and she killed and, herself that day. Split, so that's, yeah. that's another um, enormous piece of baggage that Jane has carried throughout her life. But well, we'll, I think you want to talk about Jane's uh, well, accomplishments you know, as a matter too, of fact, that was one of Jane's great fears that she would be like her mother while she was nothing like her mother. Let me just tell you about this woman in the, just encapsulated. She was, I think, probably, and I don't think this is hyperbolic, I think that she was one of the great women of not only of her era, but of her century in terms of what she accomplished. First of all, let me, she had 51 films and a documentary about Vietnam. Uh, two television shows, and incidentally, her latest one is fabulous, I think. She did, she wrote five books, did 12 audio tapes, 23 videos, of which she sold 16 million, which was the most ever sold to that date. She raised for the campaign for economic democracy, which was uh, uh, having to do with Hugo Chavez and the farm workers. She raised from these videos $17, 17 million, million dollars yeah. and gave it to them. She also had two Academy Awards and nominated for, I think, about seven others. Uh, she had Tony nominations, I mean, she and uh, Emmy nominations. Uh, she, and then, of course, she had the Jane Fonda Center for Adolescent Reproductive Health at Emory University and the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention. Everything that she did, she I mean, she accomplished at the highest possible levels. And here mm -hmm. she was, as we've spoken, and do, you know, come in, but she had a very difficult childhood. An absent father, a mother who committed suicide, but she went on to accomplish so much. And as I t told you, she was spurred on by Stanislavski, by, by, Stanislav by the Stanislavski method. And incidentally, her father hated it when she uh, spoke mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, how important this was, hogwash. It was nothing now, right. nothing. But she did early on, went to Emma Willard School in Troy, New York. Mm -hmm. Well, not the prettiest place in the United States of America and very buttoned down and then went on to Vassar, which she hated. Mm -hmm. And I just have to tell a fast story and I'll, I'll forget what I'm saying again. Um, but my partner Jordan was at Yale and, um, and Jane was at Vassar. And uh, one of his friends was James Franciscus. Do you remember James Franciscus? Woo, very he was gooey or goey. And <laughs> that, that was his nickname. And they were all, I guess, in Cape Cod or something. And they buried Jane Fonda in the sand. I mean, it's a signature event of his life. I'll never go to the beach with him as a result. But anyway, imagine bur it, it being a, a college student and burying Jane Fonda. But she did not stay at Vassar. Mm -hmm. She then went on uh, to Broadway and to modeling. Right. And she was quite successful. She went out to Hollywood. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the rest is history. Sarah, we've been watching ever since the early days. We continue to watch. Um, let me ask Scott this. 
Henry and Jimmy as fellow actors, uh, you mentioned that they were not big fans of method acting. Talk about that a little bit. Well, again, it's a generational thing. I can't think of any actor of, of uh, the pre-war generation, shall we say, who thought method acting was a positive impact on acting. Fonda and Stewart were very different in, in a lot of unimportant ways, but they were extremely similar in all the important ways, uh, especially in their approach to the craft, mm -hmm. which was based completely on the text, that you had mm -hmm. to learn the lines backwards, forward, up and down, and that you had to respect the text, otherwise why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, It was all based on the script right. uh, and respect for the script. They felt that the method by asking actors to recall memories that were similar to what the characters were feeling so as to make the, make the characterization more natural, right. theoretically, right. was actually privileging the actor over the character. Mm. And that it was right. tilting, right. tilting the equation away from what acting should be, which is an act of imagination that involves the audience right. yeah. with the actor because you create okay. the imaginary bond together. Cool. Uh, but, but you that see, was their it's, take. It's classic acting versus method. And yes. they were in exactly. that generation. Yes. Well, classic is ac action oriented mm -hmm. and method is emotion oriented. Mm -hmm. And they were like Balanchine was with us. You, no, he used to say no emotion, just motion, because he wanted you to have enough technique and, the, and that bag of, of tricks to reach into. He knew the emotion would come out in the performance because you were a professional. But don't act it. But, but, but it's not for yeah. everyone. And this is the thing, it's the, look, the end result. Henry had one methodology, mm -hmm. Jane another, and yet both of them were extraordinary actors. Right, it's generational, as Scott said. But I have a question to ask you. I, I'm interjecting this once again. As we talk about the method, uh, you know, the, the method, we have two method actresses, Meryl Streep and Jane Fonda, mm -hmm. both great. Who do you well, think, if, now if someone put a, a, a gun to your head and said, which of the two do you think is the better actress? Well, <laughs> I would say that Meryl Streep's having a better third act than Jane Fonda is. Because Meryl, she's a lot younger. She's a little younger. She's what, sixty-five? About 66? thirteen years younger. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, but she's she gets first dibs on all the parts for women of a beyond a certain age. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jane took fifteen years off when she was married to Ted Turner, which completely derailed right, her career. Right. Right. And fifteen years away from the movie business, I mean, you might as well be in Forest Lawn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she had to basically start from ground zero when she got, you know, dumped Ted Turner and started tried to start a career up again. And she's got a very successful show on Netflix, but if you don't get Netflix, you don't know she's on the show. Right. You, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and Meryl gets first crack at parts the way Judy Dench gets first crack, or Maggie Smith gets first crack mm -hmm. at parts in Europe for those parts, you know. Uh, that said, when I think of Mer Meryl Streep at her best, mm -hmm. and then I contrast that with Jane Fonda at her best, right. And when I think of her best, I'm thinking of Julia and Clute and uh, They Shoot Horses, Don't oh, They? Yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Coming Home. And Coming Home. Mm -hmm. when I, what I see with Meryl Streep is a brilliant technical actress right. who rarely moves me emotionally. And what I see with Jane at her best is a naked human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. Yeah. Interesting. Thank right. you. Yeah, I, I think her portrayal in, in, of the prostitute in Clute was mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. one of the fine, fine performances mm -hmm. by a female actor. Layers and layers and layers. Yeah. One, yes, yeah. wonderful. Let's see, talking about layers, let's talk about her three husbands. Aha. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Starting with Roger yeah. Vadim, the French director, and then on to Tom Hayden, the California activist, and then Ted Turner, we all know the media mogul. First one, let's, Vadim, the Frenchman. Uh, seduced by him in every possible way. Handsome man. Handsome yeah. guy, talented. Barbarella. And very much um, into, as she would be with every man and has been since dad, whatever he wanted, which involved threesomes. Yeah, menage a trois. Menage with a trois. Like with this, <laughs> a menage a trois. And she procured the uh, trois. She would, she would pr procure the trois <laughs> yes. and have coffee with her afterwards. But she did say she That's had right. They didn't hear you she, say that. They're she like, had I coffee think that's with the best these, part. These, these chicks afterwards. In the morning. And he was, she was so worried she wouldn't be considered 
bourgeois by not getting into this. Um, she said in the book she had to get liquored up to, to, to do this, understandable. The coffee or the menage a trois? <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not the conversation. Right. That was yeah. too late at that but, point. But you know, she, this is the thing about Jane. She was so forthcoming about everything. You know, when she, but she talks about when she was married to the demon, she had one great affair, but in this moment of discretion, she wasn't going to tell us who it was. But she, in her, oh, her, her biography is extraordinary. And she is so visceral, so real. And mm -hmm. is not, she, well, she's a very courageous woman. Mm -hmm. And she is not afraid to expose herself on any level. And she mm -hmm. does. Right. I mean, she is, as you said, naked as an actress, mm -hmm. naked as a person. Mm -hmm. She is totally exposed. Lights, camera, action. Exa she's a fool, yeah. <laughs> But it was interesting, not only, of course, aside from the menage a trois, she met the most extraordinary people. Yeah. You know, the existentialists, Simone mm -hmm. Signore, these people who were leftists, very activists, very involved, and it really, they served as a catalyst for her activism, coupled, of course, with her father's sense of social justice. So that was all, you know, really a foundation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for what she became later. And it was, you know, quite amazing. Right. And then she met, you know, she went back to Hollywood. Yeah. Just did a little, they don't little shoot disillusioned horses. with several years later with this this marriage. But they did have a daughter, oh, yeah. Vanessa. They did have a ch yeah. one daughter, Vanessa. And as she said, the most wonderful thing about Vadim was that he was the greatest father, and he continued, yeah. to, continued be to be throughout yeah. his life a very good father. But when she went back to Hollywood to do They Don't Shoot Horses, mm -hmm. she was uh, really feeling that the marriage was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was her first plunge into activism with the Indians when she came back. She did a little of this. Right. And she met Tom Hayden. Moved back in with Dad, though. Into the well, house she left, in the right. guest quarters. Yes. And she Dad had, well, was a little had, unhappy about that. He was most happy when she was, you know, self sufficient. Yeah. It wasn't about money. It but was he just was very good to her, and he did give her the guest house, and she mm -hmm. was there with a daughter and a nanny. And, and then she met Tom Hayden. Yeah. And he was, as you know, um, a part of the Chicago 7, which was once the Chicago 8, but mm -hmm. the Chicago, and he was an SDS. It was a really very left-wing guy, and she was mesmerized by him. One of the things she said, the most seductive thing about Tom Hayden was his articulation. Yeah. She said he, when he spoke, she was just absolutely, you know, th blown away. That's what Fonda liked about him. Henry liked him because yes. Henry needed a writer. He couldn't. He was not articulate, particularly as a person, one-on-one, uh, mm -hmm. -on -one, or even in front of a group. He would be ter like most actors. He was terrified to get up in front of a group unless he had a script. Uh, but he, Hayden could get up and do a half hour, a wonderful half hour speech off the top of his head with no notes, no, mm -hmm. and nothing, just 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 flat. And he just thought that was the most extraordinary gift. As did and Jane. And he liked to fish. Blew her away. And he liked, uh, liked oh, to fish. Yeah. And Hank also liked to fish. But you know what struck me um, as a Palm Beach person was that she married Tom Hayden. I'm really not a Palm Beach person. She married Tom Hayden, and they immediately moved into a hovel. I mean, they moved into the worst neighborhood. The studio he wanted studio. to be yeah. with the people. And she didn't have a washer or a dryer. She had to take her clothes to the lawn. This is, a, you know, this Oscar winner to the laundromat. And... Ladies, you're going to be shocked when I tell you this. He made her sell her Cartier watch. Oh. Grounds for divorce. Yeah. No? Not, good. Not, right. good. Not good. Not good. Not good, Not good at well, all. Well, they, they slept in a mattress on, a, on the they floor, They slept on the too. floor, right. He wanted to be with the people. Yeah, exactly. I remember that, yeah. But, of course, we're skipping because in the midst of all this, he really before her. they married, he suggested that yeah. she go to North Vietnam. By herself. Exactly. Now, remember, and we lose sight of this, Jane Fonda was about 33 or 34 years old when she went to North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. She was a young woman. Mm -hmm. And she was very much imbued 
with her anti-war you know, feelings and beliefs, and many of us harbored the same feelings. She just acted upon it. And I think she was kind of blown away by it all. And, and she went there and in a kind of a, a moment, uh, was, was they took a picture of her on this cannon. Mm -hmm. And right. as we know, she became Hanoi Jane. Right. And never really quite yeah. outlived. She's been apologizing for it ever since, but you know, um, as Americans, we forgive, but we don't forget. So that still is a very sensitive button for a lot of people. What she said was, among many other things, I should have listened more, spoken less, and there I was trying to, to appear as a revolutionary with Barbarella playing around the corner. That's right. You know, so exactly. she, made, she made fun of herself, and I thought that was very, you know, important to, to, yeah. but, to hear uh, but, how she but felt but about today, it. Today, even today, you will see tweets in which people say the most horrific things about her, and she still is carrying, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that moniker. But the point is, you have to admire this woman. I mean, she did act upon her feelings, yeah. and she had, you know, she had a lot to lose and not a yeah. lot to gain when she True. did this. True. Didn't affect her uh, Hollywood career, though. No. She, well, yes, right after this, she won the Academy Award for Clute. And when she was going to be asked to accept the award, she went to her father mm -hmm. and asked him, should she make a political statement? And he said, this is not the time and place to do that. You know, you, right. you know, this and she another took, time. took his advice. Do you, think, do you think that Meryl, <laughs> Meryl uh, Streep should have asked his spirit for the Golden Globes? Because, you know, uh, whether I believe in what she was saying or not is irrelevant. There is a time and a place, don't, don't we all agree? And that, that just sort of watered down the whole platform for these artists being celebrated by other artists. So, so I mean, it was, it was great advice from her father, yeah. who was in the same position as she was mm. on those issues, mm. I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, you know, what's interesting to me as I started to channel this woman was to think of somebody who had so much talent, beauty, charm, I mean, an extremely bright, bright woman, and yet, she was so terribly insecure, so insecure, and went through years, I mean, 20 or more years of anorexia, bulimia, was taking dexedrine, I mean, really A good part flagellating her, her body. Well, well she, she, when her mother showed her, when she was very young, would you like to see the scar from my surgery? Was it kidney mm -hmm. surgery? And Jane said no, but her mother showed it Anyway, and she was horrified mm. and really disgusted by it. She was frightened by it, and she swore. I think she, she was holding her breath ever since. That certainly did not help this person that was born into this world as someone so unhappy with herself and trying to prove herself to well, the father. Well, there was another thing that happened, and again in your book, is that she overheard her father saying to someone, uh, that uh, Gary Cooper's daughter, Maria. Maria, Maria, Maria has a beautiful face, but Jane has the body, and so mm. if your father, you know, you have to maintain that. I mean, it was very important for her, mm -hmm. even though as a child she was a tomboy and wasn't interested, was afraid of right. being a woman, Did and always had women's issues, right? And even said that she came to the feminist movement late. I mean, this is an activist. This is a woman activist and came, you know, late to the, uh, to the feminist movement. And so, yeah. on to her third right. husband. But <laughs> she would binge and per because this food yeah. thing is really important to just finish up with. She, she would binge and purge eight times a day. Mm -hmm. she, and not unusual, she was um, a, a devout, ballet class taker, which I found interesting to read because there was order required. There was a mirror that you did not take your eyes off of. You were never good enough. Um, and when there was no ballet class, this was daily for years, she would bring in pre people to, to train her. I don't think that she would have had the success with her 
exercise videos if she didn't loathe her body so much. No. I, I really don't. You think it was a form of self-punishment? Not so much self-punishment, the exercise, but it was, it was a control. I can somewhat deal with myself on this planet if I don't have a bump in my stomach and I don't have a, a role. She was so unhappy with herself, and the mother influence had a lot to do yeah. with that, and that scar was but a turning know, point, too. But you know, both anorexia and bulimia, it is said, you know, is, is a function of, of a woman not feeling a sense of control over her life. Mm -hmm. and, her, and, and if you purge or you deny yourself food, you are controlling something. You're controlling mm -hmm. your intake and outtake of food. And, mm -hmm. and so the ballet and the anorexia and the bulimia, and again, I go back to the fact that what is it that makes people happy and secure? And guess what? I have a theory on that. And okay. I, I think it's your childhood. It's your parents. You are their mirrors. Mm -hmm. And if you look into that mirror and you see ugly and you see fat and you see stupid, you have to spend the rest of your life overcoming that image. Undoing that. Yeah. And she so referred no to this matter what she accomplished. It was the disease to please, she the called it, right? The disease to please, yes. And she said that this is what happened in her husband's until she yeah. got to her third act. But let's talk a little bit about Ted Turner. Okay. And, uh, and Jane, that was, he called her the day he found out that she was divorced from Tom Hayden, the very day. Yeah, and she was with Tom Hayden the longest. That was about 17 years. Yeah, a right? long time. Uh, yeah. But and, he and told her on Christmas morning, Merry Christmas, I'm in love with another woman. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's Have a nice day. Yeah. And, and see if you can get you your like Cartier your watch back. <laughs> do we, do we want to Where's the Cartier watch? Can we, can we slip on Golden <laughs> Pond in here first? We can slip anything we want, I'm right? I'm dying to hear you <laughs> talk about that. The ultimate. Well, I think and, and Scott, because of his take on this through his Henry. Well, that was Jane's Valentine. most overt uh, 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 attempt to affect a rapprochement with her father, mm -hmm. emotionally as well as professionally. Mm -hmm. There was no professional problem. He uh, thought she was a great actress, and he would say so to anybody that asked. Uh, but there was still this emotional divide. So she was, in, in, in buying this property, which is a successful Broadway play, off-Broadway play, uh, successful off-Broadway play, uh, and casting her father, she's, it, and, and it's about a difficult father-daughter relationship that ends with, you know, a rapprochement at the end. Full at circle. The very end. So she was hoping that this would be replicated, that this would be the key to, to, to putting to, be, to, to rest all the demons. Mm -hmm. uh, and she cast Kate Hepburn. The second choice after Kate Hepburn was going to be Barbara Stanwyck if Kate Hepburn had turned it down. Uh, and the first thing out of Kate Hepburn's mouth when she met Jane Fonda was, I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> because Hepburn would, would tr because she was a star and she wanted the attention, she, t t she, was, she always had to be the most remarkable human being in the room. So, and, and Fonda told me, she said the odd thing was, she I don't think she liked me. I thought it was sincere. She didn't like me because Kate believed that you had to either be an actress or have a life. Mm -hmm. That you, if you were gonna be an actress, you needed to give it 100%, you could not have a husband, you could not have children, you couldn't even have a dog. Mm -hmm. You know, because right. Hepburn no. had had a husband when she was 22 and that hadn't worked out. And she didn't have pets, and she had Spencer Tracy when she wanted him. But other right. than that, she was on her own. Did she have a girlfriend? Well. I'm just curious. Did she Go have on. a girlfriend? Yeah. Go on. She, early on, she Discuss. did. Discuss. But so. No. Later. <laughs> she always had a companion. Okay. There was usually a female companion in the okay. picture someplace. Okay. Uh, but tell that story tasteful. about on Golden Pond. The, when, the, the okay. key sequence on Golden Pond yeah. is on the dock between the mother, yeah. I mean the, the, the daughter and the father. And as a matter of fact, parenthetically, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Josh Logan tried to buy the property first, and he was going to cast Jimmy Stewart, but Jimmy Stewart read the script and said, I won't do it, because I think he's a terrible human being, and he treats his daughter atrociously. And then Fonda bought the property, so it became a moot point. Didn't mean anything oh. to him. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, the key scene is, is at the end of the picture, but on the dock between the father and the daughter. 
and they did the long shot, and Fonda hit, her, hit, hit all the marks, and then they were going to move in for the close-ups. And they were going to move in on Fonda's close-up, and Fonda went dry. Now, this is something that happens to actors occasionally. Jane did. Jane went, Jane went dry. And, and you, you reach a certain point in, in one angle, and then you have to repeat it for an angle, and you can't get there again. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was a one take thing. The tears won't come the mm -hmm. second or third time. This happens. Mm -hmm. And she was panicking because right. everybody's standing around waiting for her. Right. And she knew she was stuck. And uh, she said, I need a couple minutes, you know. And she walked off by herself to try to pull herself together. And over in the bushes, she sees Hepburn. And Hepburn's going, <laughs> You can do it. You can right. do it. Right. And even though Hepburn and she were not close, right. Hepburn had sensed she was in trouble right. and gave her the moment right. so she cool. could do the scene. Wow. So she does the scene, and that night she and her father are having dinner, and she tells him what happened, that she went dry. Mm -hmm. And he goes, uh-huh. And she said, did you ever go dry, Dad? Nope. <laughs> wow. wow. You've never gone dry, not in 50 years? No. Wow. You know, he wouldn't even, even, even if he was lying, he wouldn't. He wouldn't say, sure, it happens. You know, he wouldn't put himself out like that. How do you learn but, how to cry? I mean, I'm not an actor. How do you learn how to cry? Oh, actors can Besides cry. Besides watching you can Hallmark. Cry, you, you, well, you, actors can cry for coaches. A method actress? Wrong. Yeah. Not Jeez, I don't know what but, but he wasn't, the, the, the other story I was thinking of is when they were in the boat and she was not in the scene. I mean, mm -hmm. that she was, she reached out and touched him mm -hmm. and he, he did not expect it because that was not rehearsed. But she felt the impulse. She reached and she looked at him and he was crying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and those were not crocodile tears. I mean, mm -hmm. and she said it was, it was so moving to her. And he won the first in all his great illustrious roles. It was the first Academy Award he ever won. Mm -hmm. And he was dying. He was home. He, he was couldn't home, yeah. be there. And she went back. Mm -hmm. She, she received the award in right. his name and then went uh, to his home where he was mm -hmm. in bed. He died, what, five months later, yeah, I think? a couple right. months later. And gave him the award. And this yeah. was, as you said, that rapprochement mm -hmm. and perhaps a resolution. He could, express, he could only express emotion as a character. Yeah. Right. He could express emotion on paper. He, some of the notes he wrote his last wife, Shirley, are lovely. But again, there had to be some sort of intermediary, uh, intermediating uh, uh, process. Sure, sure. He could not look at someone and say, I love you. Right. You know, it just didn't work for him. He couldn't right. get it out. He could do it as a character. He could do it on paper. He could do it indirectly, but not directly. Jimmy Stewart lived 15 years longer than him. How did mm -hmm. he react to losing his, his best friend? The story is Fonda died at Cedars sinai and the word went out, and everybody began gathering at Fonda's house which where Shirley still lives. It's the highest hill in Bel Air. His fifth wife, Shirley. Fifth wife, Shirley. Shirley was about 30 some years younger than he was. They were married for uh, 15, no, more like 18 years. Uh, and it was a very happy marriage. Um, <laughs> and they, everybody gathered, Jane, Peter, Jimmy Stewart, James Garner, who was a good friend, uh, the, 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 everybody that loved Fonda gathered there. And there are, and you know, everybody's, the women are feeding the men and doing what you do at a, at a wake, basically. And Stuart's sitting in the library in the chair that I sat in when I was talking to Shirley, as a matter of fact. And the, the house, it's hard to describe, it's a Spanish house, and it's a Henry Fonda Museum. The house is full of Henry Fonda's paintings, and Fonda was a superb painter in a kind of Andrew Wyeth mode, very realistic and beautiful watercolors and uh, uh, tempera, beautiful painter. Uh, and his needlepoint, another thing he would do, he would do needlepoint. Which and you macrame. Could, macrame, because you yeah. can do, you, on a film set, you wait a lot, and he couldn't pick up and put a painting down on a film set. It's, it, the, the, the intensity is too, but needlepoint and macrame, you can put up and lay down. Yeah. So he started to do that in his, in his 60s on film sets. Anyway, the, all the paintings are still where they were hung when he was alive. His pillows are still all scattered around the house. And Stewart sat there in Fonda's chair for a half an hour, and nobody knew what to say to him because they were very close. They were blood brothers, and they're kind of moving around him, mm -hmm. not wanting to disturb him because he was wow. lost in his own thoughts. Sure. He was staring off into space, and finally, out of nowhere, he said, it was by far the biggest kite we ever flew, 
<laughs> and then he told this story about, it was after the war, they came back from, Fonda came back from the South Pacific and Stewart came back from Europe. And they started flying these huge kites that Fonda had picked up during the war from the Navy, you know, Navy signal kites. And they started building these kites, these huge 10-foot kites. And about how uh, the wind would just pick you up. They needed both of them to hold on, or because only one, one of them would get picked up. The mm -hmm. wind was so strong, mm -hmm. uh, and the the joy they had felt in 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 flying these kites, and it was this kind of soliloquy. Yeah. And Jane was sobbing, and Shirley was okay. sobbing, and that was. And then and we got to the end of the story. He stopped talking. That oh. was it. It was a silent friendship in many ways. Mm -hmm. It was a boy's so that's friendship. so appropriate. It was like a boy's friendship. All their hobbies yeah. were boy's yeah. hobbies. Yeah. Model airplanes, flying yeah. kites. Right. You know, it was a way of decompressing from the pressures of being famous actors. And so, so the, the day after, you wanted to, to jump to this, the day after she divorced Tom Hayden, the, Jane, Yeah. the phone rang. It, right? it, well, yeah, well, I was saying that the day after yeah. she got this call from Ted, Ted Turner. Turner, who blew her away completely. I mean, she said this this whirlwind, he, bah, 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 and he was talking a mile a minute, and he was carrying on, and I've got to see you. And she said, look, I'm, I need time. And so it was a kind of on again, off again situation. And in between, she had a love affair with a, an Italian oh, yeah. fellow, 17 years her junior. Uh, and, and then that broke off. And Peter called Ted Turner and told him, because he liked Ted a lot, they, they both, they had places in Wyoming, I think it was, yeah. and told her, and, and told Ted that it was over with the Italian stallion. And um, I don't believe this, I have to tell you. I am sure that Jane told Peter to call him. I mean, I know women, it was not, he did not right. do it on his own volition. <laughs> I am sure. Okay, we're not going to argue, are we? She was very no. smart. And so he called, and, and Ted once again started romancing her, taking her out. He was buying all sorts of land out in the West, and she was coming and going and doing. They broke off. They came back again. He was then, a year younger, by the way. Yes, but not Which, 17. Not 17. Yes. No, not so, Italian. Mm -hmm. So anyway, <laughs> she, she married him. Right. She married the man. But he gave full disclosure. He said, I can't be alone. I need a woman with me 24-7. I need somebody to help me finish my sentences. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. So he gave full disclosure, and she was still <laughs> Well, she was uh, never, smitten. it seemed to me, she was never quite comfortable. And yet, there was a kind of glamorous life. I mean, of course, the best thing is that he was a little cheap. And so they had a, 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 an apartment in the CNN building. And in order to in get Atlanta. to their apartment, in Atlanta, in, in Atlanta yeah. and she, in order to get to that apartment, she had to go through the newsroom and go yeah, the to get up and walk up, up, up the steps. And up a treacherous spiral staircase. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To their abode. To their abode. But at right. least she had a washer and dryer. Well, that was, anyway. Did he make her fly coach? <laughs> no, he Good. had his own plane. Yeah. But so, they were married, uh, what, for about 10 years, I guess. But on her 60th birthday, she had a huge party. And for the party, she prepared a, a video about herself, her entire life up until that point. And she employed the services of her daughter, Vanessa, who did some production. And Vanessa said, why bother with a video? Why don't you just get a chameleon and have it walk across the screen? I always say, you don't know what humility is until you have children. But <laughs> at any rate, she uh, had this 60th birthday, and Ted gave her a gift. $10 million for a foundation. And he put this foundation in her name, and mm -hmm. it gave her the ability to give to all the causes mm -hmm. that she wanted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, they were divorced. Mm -hmm. 2001. 2001, yeah. they were divorced. And Primarily because, well, one of the major reasons was because she had discovered God along the way. 
and uh, she became a born again Christian, and he just couldn't tolerate that. Well, he was an atheist. He is an atheist. Yeah. But and, don't opposites uh, attract? Mm -hmm. And the real, and of course, yeah, I can but imagine that being doesn't necessarily main. last. <laughs> right, that's true. Well, he One was also only. fooling around. She always said that Ted was a really wonderful businessman and always hedged his bets. So just in case she was going to leave him and he needed another babysitter, he was testing out you know, other women. So all through their relationship, he did have other women. And he told her about it. Yeah. He told her. His con list was so long compared to his pro that he offered to her on the way in. And she still went for the ride. Not yeah. such a bad ride. Well, she had, as, you know, as one might say, she learned something from each one of the men, you know, w w with whom she had a relationship. Well, also, they're and all, evolved. But mm -hmm. they're all, she's, ad she's adopting a submissive role in each of the marriages. Absolutely. In each one of the marriages, yeah. she's yeah. adopting a submissive role. Whereas right. publicly and in her work, she was completely dominant. Right, That's exactly. So true. See, there, so she's got this strong yin and strong oh, yang. Yeah. Very, con very contradictory, but somehow or another, it seemed to work for her. But she, she did say, uh, as Steve mentioned, the disease to please, that she was so intent upon attracting her father's attention and wanting to please him. She still that is. This, yeah. She still is. She is. She is. When you see her interview, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in the Barbara Walters interview, she is still obsessed with this and still mm -hmm. obsessed with him. Mm -hmm. Talking about interviews, how many of you saw the Megyn Kelly interview? You saw that Megyn Kelly oh interview? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. See, oh, boy. Do we, do we you know what we're talking well, about? Well, in the Megyn okay. Kelly, it, you, you know, um, Jane has made a new movie, and I really highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. With one. Redford. With Redford. Yeah. Souls in the Night. Our Souls at Night. With Robert Redford. The once and beautiful Robert Redford, and she was on, you know, promoting the film with Megyn Kelly. To and promote that's what, the film, yeah, but the first question was, and turned and said, "You've had a facelift, haven't you?" Or she asked him. Something like and that. And she was, she said, "I came she did here that. to talk. I came here to talk about, you know, about the film. This is right. what I'm here for," and she. Then Megyn Kelly started, you know, you who talk about growing old gracefully and you have, and gave her this whole spiel about you know, being, hip, you know, basically that she was hypocritical, which started a terrible feud. And Megyn Kelly got on television and, and then really Hanoi Jane her. No holds barred. No holds barred. None. And I, I just feel, why didn't Jane, who's so bright, who's so amazing, just say, yeah, I did. I'm an actress. Right. I wanted to look as good as I can. Why right. not? Well, she has a Wait history. Wait until you're my age, Megan. Right. <laughs> yeah. She has a history of opening her mouth to change feet. Mm -hmm. And it, it, she had a long hiatus from that. And then here, I'm sure she's kicking herself, thinking, why did I go there? Why didn't I just say, well, mm -hmm. yes, I did. But let's talk about the film. That's what I'm here to talk about. But she didn't. Well, she, she did say, I, I'm here to talk about the film. That but, was it. But she did not say, well, but yes, she was I defensive. did. She went, Zing. I saw it, yeah. But I, knowing what you but know anyway, about her. But anyway, on to Jane's anyway, third act. But anyway, this her third act. Self-analysis, oh, yeah. no more men. You know, self she's going to be her own. And self-discovery. Famous indeed, last words. Yeah. Right. Right. She discovered feminism, I mean, and continued her activism. She went back to movie making. I think it was 15 years she made Monster in Law. We saw right. some, some footage from that. <laughs> really great in it, I thought, and a very funny movie. She reunited with her daughter, Vanessa, who she had been a little estranged right. with, her son, Troy. She got closer with him. Uh, and she became, became a, good, a grandma. Yeah, a good grandmother. And she continued work with her foundation and the ultimate success with Netflix. And as Scott said, if you don't have net Netflix, where, where Will is you Jane be? Fonda? Where, where do old actresses go? Right. But th then. But while, de while pledging all, all of this time to never depend on a man again. Except, except she did have an eight year relationship <clears throat> with a record producer, Richard Perry. Richard Perry. And uh, he developed, actually, Parkinson's, and they decided to split, I mean, as a result of right. that. But she, I just have to read You got to read that. I've got to read it, and I'm going to. 
Okay, good. Um, this is what she said about Richard Perry. I've never had such a fulfilling sex life. The only thing I have ever known is true intimacy. The only thing that I've ever wanted is true intimacy with a man. I absolutely want to discover that before dying. It has happened with Richard. I feel totally secure with him. Often when we make love, I see him as he was 30 years ago. Now, May I say something to that? Of course. It, with all due respect, Mr. Perry, I've seen pictures of you. <laughs> she should forget the workout videos and start marking whatever pill she's on these days. <laughs> End of story. I mean, that's how I feel. No offense. Well, but I digress. It's, it's, you'll be happy to know it's over. Hmm? <laughs> it's over. It's over. And she's looking. Anyway, no. So, but, Scott. But in, in summing this up, yeah. let's describe. Scott, or Jane. Let's I want live. Scott to go yeah. in there. You said she was the little engine that could. Mm. And you also talked about, of course, how her father in public on paper was in awe of her. But if you had to write a, sh a short paragraph about Jane Fonda, which you have done more than a short paragraph, <laughs> summing up her life so far, which is the name of the book, uh -huh. where would you begin? Her f she told me the only time her father ever hit her. He hit her once. She was, it was when she was at that private school in Connecticut. Emma Roy. Fonda hated Connecticut because he thought it was full of Who? white, racist, country club Republicans. <laughs> and he's driving. He's driving, and she's in the back seat, and out, out of her mouth pops the N-word. The N-word. The N-word. The N-word. Yeah. He, he pulls over. He stops the car. He leans back and he pops her one in the mouth. Not real hard, but he hit her. And then he proceeded to yell at her. I mean, really yell at her. And Fonda didn't yell, he went silent. But this time he really exploded, as if, as Peter said, it was not only as if you said the word, it was as if you had invented what it meant. Yeah. He really let her have it. And she, she never got over that moment. So what it seems to me she embodies is that spirit of social, a, a social conscience, and that it, your work needs to be part and parcel of who you are as a human being. It's not just an abstraction, it's not light entertainment. You're not doing it to make money. If the money comes, that's fine, but that's not your, it's gotta stand for something. The work has to stand for something. An artist has to stand for something. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there's that. On the other hand, there is the, because of her, fa her father's inability to express emotion. Jane will tell you about her first sexual experience, her menage a trois, her this, her that, as if she's trying to compensate for all those years where she was getting nothing back from her father. Mm -hmm. So there's a, but it's a continual conversation, but it's kind of a conversation on Henry's terms, in a sense. Still. So my sense of Jane is, from spending some time with her, and from Shirley and a lot of time with Peter, is that, None of those kids fell very far from Henry Fonda's tree. I think that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for being here. Make sure you get a book and out front. Thank you, everybody, for please, being here. Thank you so much for being here.